So great to have you here. Thank you, band. You look awesome. I'm wearing a suit. I'm finally looking like a real pastor. I finally arrived. It took me five years, but we got there. And uh, when I got up and I was planning on wearing what I was wearing, and then someone in my household, I'm not going to say who, someone in my household uh, said this to me, it's Christmas. And what I have learned is when somebody breaks down the syllables like that, it's serious. And so I chose to suit up and, uh, you know, just, just, just a little something, just a little something for Christmas. So are you, are you, are you excited this morning? I love Christmas. It's probably because there's a lot of gifts involved. So I love it. Call me superficial. Some of you are not sure if you should even be okay with that. Come on now. Who loves, who loves a good gift at Christmas? Anyone had a really bad gift before? I've had a, I've had a few. I've had a few. I once got given porcelain puppies uh, that came in a little basket. They were about that big and they were twin puppies. Um, and as my Latin family calls them, they were puppies. And so that was an incredible gift. Uh, I still have it today. It's in storage. And uh, it's, 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 it was just the best. But a good Christmas present, that's where it's at. And what really gets good when you're a dad, you can kind of buy your son presents that are for the family, if you know what I mean. One of my children may have gotten a PS4 this year. It was totally for him. And all the games that I bought him, FIFA, were totally for him. I'm a selfless man, what can I say? So I want to speak to you this morning. Uh, I think it's such a good topic, if I do say so myself, for this year and for this time of year. And just because these messages in my mind can tend to be cliched because they are what they always are. So I want to speak to you about never typical. That is my subject. Never typical. Cool, say it with me. Never typical. I love it. So good. You sound amazing. You sound like you're awake and ready to go and do this. Never typical. You know why I didn't go to church for the majority of my life? Because I had in mind the picture of a typical Christian. I had. I I had a a typical church service in mind. I had a typical flow. I had a typical idea of the religious person. I had a typical idea. I just thought that if I went to church, that my life would stop. You know, that God was actually not really into saving the world as much as He was about sucking it of all of its fun. You know what I mean? I thought if I become a Christian, if I become a Christian, then say, I'll never have fun again. And if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to marry someone I don't want to marry because I've got to be obedient. You know what I mean? You ever had that? Some, I've heard people in church say that w- women have come up to Ord and I, girls have come up to us and they've said, so I think I heard God that I've got to marry this guy, but I don't even like him. And we're like, probably not God then. Um, <laughs> not his way of operating. You know what I mean? Scan, scan, scan. You don't like that one. He's yours. <laughs> Prove yourself to me. But that was my thought. My thought was that that was a typical Christian. I thought typical Christians on a crazy wild night had a bake sale. You know what I mean? And maybe they put some hundred, like some sprinkles on the cake, like, whoa. Like, that's what my thought was. I thought that it's just boring, it's long-winded. And I also thought that typically, you know, God holds no value for my life now, if I'm honest. That's what I thought. I thought that it's about heaven, really. But at 14, you're not thinking about heaven. You know what I mean? At all, ever. So I just didn't understand the merit of it. It just had nothing for me. But then when I went to church, I found that there was nothing typical about it. And if you're here for the very first time, you might find that this is not typical. Not a typical setting, not a typical service, not a typical flow. And there's something in that. And you might go, oh, this is stylistic. But what if it's deeper than that? What if there's more to it than that? Because I don't find the story of Jesus as typical. If it was typical, every single Jewish person in that day and age would have noticed who they were standing in front of and would have completely said yes to Him and would have walked with Him because typically they had a typical idea of what the Messiah was gonna look like. And before we go through typical, just know that it means type, a type, that then you go typical, type. There was a type of Messiah they were expecting. Have you walked your life with a type of church that you've been expecting? a type of breakthrough you've been expecting, a type of marriage that you're expecting. I know that my wife did when we got married, and then she got me. But when we got married, she thought literally, we got married for different reasons, I feel. Like I got married because I thought she was gorgeous, hot, and basically also had the heart of Mother Teresa. Um, This is not for you as much as this is for my personal brownie points. Um, She, and then I thought to myself, really, I'm gonna have a helper. Like when, when I start, like when we run for life, she's gonna run with me. 
she thought first year is going to be about romance. We're going to, he's going to bring me breakfast in bed. We're going to take vacations. We're going to find ourselves somewhere in the countryside with wine and cheese on a blanket and there's never shoes on. I don't know why, but even if you look at, a, at, a, at, a, at an ad for some sort of medicine, there are never shoes on for whatever reason. Shoes just ruin the picture. And that's what she thought. Meanwhile, Chris is like trying to build a youth ministry, trying to run, trying to do stuff. She had a type of marriage she was expecting. I had a type of journey I was expecting. I had a type of journey I was expecting with this church. I had a type of journey I expected with children. I thought that they would just sleep. (laughs) I also didn't realise that they have means of communication that when one chooses to sleep the night, they tag the other one in. And they're like, okay, I've been up for the last few weeks. I'm going to sleep through the night tonight. It's your turn. I had an idea that my life was going to be a certain way. But quite often, the type of thing that we are waiting for is not the way it shows up. And the same thing happened when Jesus came to earth. Not the way we anticipate it. Did you know that what they were waiting for was someone that looked like David? You know, you heard of King David? Minor figure in the Bible. Um, is, it, is it really early or am I just really bad at what I do? Because you guys are real serious. Yeah, I'll call it out. Come on, it's Christmas. Smile, even if you don't want to, just, just fake it or I'll have to keep preaching till Christmas morning, which could get crowned. Now you're getting happy. All right. They're like, just smile. We need to get out of here. You know, I, the, the actual idea of a Messiah was around David. David, guy in the Bible, young, goes out, kills Goliath. David, conqueror. Why? Because they were oppressed. They weren't even in their own place anymore. They were under the Romans' rule. So what did they imagine? What we always imagine, our way out of what we are in. And so they thought the Messiah would come in, kicking down doors, a little bit like Rambo, come in, take over, restore the kingdom and have a king again. This is what they physically thought. This is the way they imagined it. So then Jesus comes in a very non-typical manner, offering peace through being even more peaceful offering breakthrough through the belief in a God and what He does inside of you. Completely different to what they imagined, but this is what happened. And so I want to kind of do what we do at most Christmas, at most birthday parties, because this is a birthday party. You're welcome. It's going to be awesome. This is a birthday party. Have you ever been to the birthday party where we all stop and we say something nice about the person? I just love that they're always so chirpy and I just love, you know what I mean? We're going to have one of those services. We're going to go, this is what I love about Jesus. You know why? Because here's the thing. Jesus was born to, on on this, this is that, you know, tomorrow He was born. And on that moment, what we stand on is the fact that a Saviour came into this earth with grace, with love, with mercy. But the same thing is this, is that that same Saviour sets the tone for how we live our life what we should expect in life and how we should moderate the things that we do, how, what we can expect for comes from this moment. So what if we were to stop and think about the traits that landed on earth the day that He was born? What if we stop to remember the possibilities that became realities when He was born? Because I think we can often get all about Jesus was born and we think about little sweet baby Jesus, little bald up fist, but still so omnipotent. We think of that, but we don't ever think about the fact that it means something greater than that. You know what I mean? So this is what we're going to go through. Can you go to John, 1 John uh, John 1 to 14? We're going to go through it in the message version. It says this, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighbourhood. That is just awesome. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. See, the moment that Jesus was born was a moment that you had a hope for your marriage to turn around. The moment that Jesus was born was the moment that there was a hope that anxiety was not, no longer a diagnosis you had to live with. The moment that Jesus was born was the moment that you would discover you have more capacity for forgiveness than you ever thought possible. And that that forgiveness has capacity to create a situation that you never thought possible. Forgiveness is so contrary to our actual way of living. We often feel like the longer we are upset with someone, the more we make them pay. When the reality is the more we do that, the less we get out of our life and our circumstance. See, the moment that this happened, God, Jesus, God moved into the neighbourhood, which changed everything. It was the first, there goes the neighbourhood moment. You know what I mean? 
And now you and I stand here today because there's, a, there's, there's, there's an opportunity. And I wanna speak straight into what you may be going through, what you will go through, what you've come through. I wanna remind us that today is not about just a small little baby. Today is about God putting on flesh and blood and moving into the neighbourhood so that you and I had something greater than what we've ever seen before. God gave us an opportunity to be what we're called to be. Never typical. Never did they ever imagine that He would come through a birth, a virgin birth. Never did they think He would come from the town that He came from. In fact, they said, Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth? Never was it typical. And even when it came to His ultimate statement of power, dying on the cross, never typical. What does that mean for you and I as ambassadors of Christ? We're an ambassador. You know what I mean? We, we, are, we are like, have you ever noticed that? It sounds something like a Christian cliche, but how many people don't go to church because they've met someone that goes to church? So how do we live in the same theme and vein that God seems to operate? Never typical. How do we become a church that is never typical? How do we become the kind of Christian that is never typical? The things that are typical of the, uh, typically expected of the church and typically expected of humanity, how do we do something greater? These are the things that I think we don't have to live to the typical manner. These things that I'm about to reference. Point number one is this, not typical, never typical in our forgiveness. Chris, this doesn't sound like Christmas. It is exactly what Christmas is about. Never typical in our forgiveness. We live in a world where we've got to forgive. Because every opportunity, there's an opportunity to hate more, to be angry. And it's easy to forgive when it doesn't happen to you. Isn't it, aren't you wisest when it's not your problem? I'm so wise when it's not my problem. I'm so patient when they're not my children. You know what I mean? When they're not your children, you're like, look, you just got to, you get down to their level. Look, you want a little, I mean, come on, we've got to think about. When it's your children, you're like, ah! But when it's someone else's, it's fine. This week, I had one of those moments when it came to forgiveness being something that I have to remember is a trait that is not typical in the church or the world, but it needs to be. This week, I look on my Facebook. I, I never go on Facebook. So by the way, some people write, us, write me messages on Facebook. They're gonna be there for a very long time because I don't go on Facebook. I like pictures. So I just stay on Instagram. And Facebook, there's too many things. Don't like it. What's this got to do with anything? Nothing. It's a public service announcement. Um, because I, I back up and there's like 100 messages and I'm oh, sorry, I don't read them. Um, but in my home nation, because when it hits home, it's different. There was a terrorist attack and my brother lives in that city and my nieces live in that city. And when that happens, the human side of Chris kicks in. You have an idea of typical pastor. You know what I mean? Like I'm forgiving. I do this many times during the day. These are the things we expect. But the moment I read that, anger just rises. And all of a sudden when anger rises, you start to stereotype and you start to divide. So if the world keeps creating new ways to hurt and to do something crazy, how do we then extend and create new ways to keep forgiving? How do we keep getting bigger with what we've got to forgive in a world that is always doing something crazy that can bring hurt. So how do we become non-typical Christians and non-typical people? Why? Because this thing that we are stewarding, it's stewardship. What we have in Christ is not typical. Tell me where in the world somebody can physically say that God is not just aloof and distant, but He's as real as anything else. Yes, you can't see Him, but you can feel Him. You can feel His effects. He's just like the wind. You don't see it, but you feel its effects. How do we steward something like this? because we have something that is an answer. But if we don't live as if that answer lives inside of us, we lose it. So this season and seasons to come, how are you gonna get better at your forgiving? How are you gonna forgive so radically that it feels like someone's taking advantage of you? How will you forgive so much and forgiveness without a Facebook post that says this, you've mistaken my kindness for weakness. We've all read a few of those before. The war is on. I'm gonna do me. How do you just forgive? Because forgiveness is what you were given. I've said this analogy before, but I love it. It's, you go, ever been to a basketball game and around second, third quarter, there's better seats? Don't ever go in them. That's all I've got to say. No, I, I, I creep down. I'll say it, I creep down and I make my way down and I sit there confidently until someone comes in and it, my heart starts beating. 
when someone starts coming down the aisle and they're going like this, I'm like, we're going to get caught out. We're going to get caught out. Then they come and they, you know, they get to your seat and they're like, 34D. And you're like, 34D. Oh my gosh. What are they? I mean, over at 98. Um, <laughs> X, but <laughs> courtside, uh, so confusing. Isn't it funny when you haven't paid for it, how quickly you are to just give it up? Because you just don't feel like you earn it. Wow. Meanwhile, if someone does that to me when I've paid for the seats, I'm the most arrogant person in the world. I'm like, 34D. <laughs> I know that game. Played it last week. Because somehow when you think you deserve it, you act different. Yeah. But grace is like sitting in the seats that are courtside that you don't deserve. So you've already been forgiven. And forgiveness changed you, did it not? Isn't there something about a new start? People get upset with New Year's resolutions. Why? It's an opportunity where people say they're gonna do something different. That's a good opportunity. That's a great thing. There is something about a new start. That's why we always wanna start a diet on Monday. You know what I mean? We always wanna go to the gym on Monday. Every beginning of the year, we quit things that we should quit and we start things that we should be starting. Why? There is something about a new beginning. Forgiveness gives you a new start and it also gives somebody else a new start. And if God gave you forgiveness, why would you not give someone else forgiveness? Forgiveness is not about what they deserve. Forgiveness is about what you freely get to give because you received it undeservingly. Forgiveness. What might it do in your workplace? What would it do in your marriage? What would it do in the places that you go through? What would it do in this world if we were better at forgiving, irrespective of how good people get at hurting? We've got to get better at doing those things because I don't ever want to be a typical church. What did it say in the Scripture? Throw it up again for me, please. Throw it up, throw it up. Okay. Um, Glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like Father, like Son, generous inside and out. I want to bring this one back. Never typical with our generosity. You know, this is one that churches, I think, man, we've got a lot of redeeming to do because we've, not us, but the church has preached some crazy messages centered around prosperity and whatever that might mean. And some, obviously, it is a God-given thing that He would want us to prosper. It's not just about finance, it's about moving forward in life. But when that gets preached for personal gain, It ruins something. We often get in the way of good God concepts, don't we? But how do we as a church, and we preached this a few months back, how do we live generous like God? Because God is two things. He's always generous and He's always loving. Amongst others, I know, but He is always generous and He is always loving. Generous enough to send His Son to die for us that we might have a second, third, seventh, eighth, nine, ninth chance at life. Well, let's take it back to a world looking at the church as ambassadors. We are the filter in which they look at God and say, He's real or He's not. He's loving or He's not. Because if God is real and He lives in you, yet you don't produce any fruit of a real God. So what if our church got so generous, not so that we can have more green rooms, not so that we could have bigger buildings, although one day we're gonna need a building. In fact, we already paid too much for this one, so one would come in handy. But what if we did what we did because of the people that don't know Him yet? I wanna take you back to a story. I wanna take you to the moment where a woman breaks a year's worth of perfume over Jesus' feet. She just pours it over His feet, doesn't break it, would've cut Him up. Minor thing I had to correct in my mind because I was like, how does that work? (laughs) Thank you, but I'm bleeding. Um, Thank you for that kind act. Do you also have Band-Aids? Um, they're like, what a band-aid. Sorry, I forget that I know everything they're invented in the future. You don't know those yet. Just wrap them up. Um, I'm so dumb sometimes. Um, she comes in. It's all there. And this is what happens. The whole room stops. The whole room stops. And you can tell the people that are upset with generosity because people that are usually upset with generosity, you know why they're upset with it? Because all they think is, you're being wasteful. That could have gone to me. I could have had that. I would never do that. Because that's a thing. Here's a great lesson in life and a barometer for your heart. What you can't celebrate, you've got an issue with. 
You can't celebrate somebody else's good marriage. Probably got an issue in yours. I can't celebrate the church that's growing down the road. Probably got an issue in mine. I can't celebrate somebody else's win. Probably losing a lot in my life. Haters hate because their life is not great. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. Haters hate because their life's not great. Bam. I don't know, Holy Spirit's falling in this place. It must be the suit. You can't celebrate what's happening in someone else's life. It's quite often because it's not happening in yours. You got an issue with it. And that's what happened in that room. Some were like, how could she? We could, feel, we could feed the poor with it. When was the last time you fed the poor? We could though. But what did it also do? It says this, it arrested everybody's attention. The church has been really good at being more like a bank, gaining money and holding it. But what if the church got really good at having more so it could give more? What if our generosity at People Church went so far beyond what is happening in these four walls that it arrested the attention of a nation? What if we were so generous that we could do things like we did today, give gifts to every single child that comes today? And you might not think that's much, but to the child that's never been to church before, that's a great statement of who God is, a generous God that gives. What if we could actually build homes for homeless people to get rehabilitated that they could actually be cared for and loved on again? And what if we could, I don't know, start schools where they've been shut down because apparently we don't have enough money for them, but they're always shut down in the neighbourhoods that need schools more. Like what if, what if we could do that? Well, that doesn't happen because we forget. It doesn't happen because, you know, if we don't live like this, if we don't live like God, if we don't remember what Jesus did for us, can I encourage you, church, this is just a, it's just a fact. If our generosity is smaller than our vision, we'll never see our vision. And our vision has never, ever been about bigger buildings and nicer cars. Our vision has always been about the fact that on the south and the west side of our city, here in Humble Park, are three of the major murder rates in our whole city. Our city having the highest murder rate in our whole nation and rivaling countries around the world. Most of those countries being third world. Does that not, is that not crazy? Third world, third world behaviour happening in a first world country, yet we enjoy our first world comforts. You know why? Change can never happen until the most comfortable stop enjoying their comfort, until the least comfortable can enjoy theirs. I don't know if I wanna give. I mean, I've got bills, but what if your giving saved a life? Because <laughs> until our comfort takes a back seat, their comfort will never arrive. I think Jesus took a back seat. In fact, He says it all through Scripture. He's sitting there with the disciples and He says things like this, how much longer must I be with these people? <laughs> so encouraging, it actually encourages me. Any moment that I have a I don't like people moment, I feel okay. Because Jesus is like, how much longer? Really, really God, You sent me here. In fact, at one point Jesus says this, before He makes His way to the cross, He says, if you can, if you can, <laughs> He appeals to heaven. I'm just, I'm just throwing this out here, Dad. If you, if you will, if you can, if there's any way. I mean, I know the whole story from front to back. I mean, I know, but if there is, if anything's changed since I made it to earth, can you take this cup from me? But nevertheless, nevertheless, most powerful words in the Bible for me. Nevertheless, let your will be done. If we're gonna live generous, nevertheless is going to have to be a word that proceeds our comfort statements. I want this, but nevertheless, I have an issue with giving. It's true, I have an issue because I've been hurt. I've gone to churches and they've taken it, but nevertheless, God, I give to You and not to the man in front of me. God, I, I wanna go on that vacation, but nevertheless, maybe I can go the month later because nevertheless, God, I wish I had, but nevertheless, there's a difference between living out what we want to live and living out what God called us to live. The difference is this, that when we live out what God calls us to live, we live at another level. You never come second by putting God first. 
And I want to encourage you in this place. If there's two things we remember, if there's two things that we could remember about the way that God entered this earth, entered the neighbourhood, wrapped Himself in flesh so that you and I could receive forgiveness and operate in the same way that He operated and bring generosity. This Christmas season, why don't you become generous? Here's a real practical one. There's people in this building that probably don't have family. There's people in this building that aren't from this city. If you know about them, why don't you extend some generous action and invite them into your home? Why don't you have them over? Why don't you remember the things that God did for us? And let that be the moderator of what we do for others. I don't want to be a typical church. I don't want to be a typical Christian. I don't want to be that type that people have in their minds as a barrier between them and God and them and this community. Let's be the kind of church that we're called to be. Let's remember at Christmas that it is about family, it's about fun, it's about presents, it's about PlayStation 4, it's about a whole bunch of things. But can we please remember that it's also one of the most pivotal moments that ever happened in history where change became a possibility because God sent His only Son in a non-typical way so that you and I don't have to live a typical life.